Jesus, Lord, you're worthy of all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. Oh, it makes me want to shout hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, Lord, you're worthy of all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. And when I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the uttermost. And when I think about the Lord, how he picked me up, turned me around, how he placed my feet on solid ground. Oh, it makes me want to shout hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, Lord, you're worthy of all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Oh, it makes me want to shout hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, Lord, you're worthy of all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. Oh, it makes me want to shout hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, Lord, you're worthy of all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Oh, it makes me want to shout. Yeah, I'm a shouting kind of girl, so I like that song. Amen. I want to shout. I got stuff to shout about. Jesus is Lord. Okay, one of you got that. Okay. <laughs> hey, good evening, Transformation Church and those that are watching online. And this is our fifth straight service. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night with our evangelist Glenn Meldrum and, and Jesse today at 10 o'clock with the ladies. It's been quite a week, has it not? I call that soaking in Jesus, soaking in Jesus. And each night has been getting better and better, and the Holy Spirit's just been moving in our, our lives, in my life personally. So it's been a great week. And guess what? They'll be back Sunday morning and Sunday night as well. Amen. And you're going to stop paying me because we have so many other preachers here, right? <laughs> no, it's been good, and we've been so happy to have our friends. And tonight, wow, Christian, Christian, welcome. Welcome home, brother. Welcome home. And Dwayne and Lisa, it's such a joy. You really made my, my week. And it's been a great week, and, but to see you this evening and visiting with us. I shouldn't say visiting because this is Christian's home. Amen. This is his home. Praise God. Praise God. And Judy, welcome this evening. Good to see Judy. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, I know you've had a rough, well, months and months and months. So good to see Judy tonight. Praise the Lord. Well. Yeah. We're going to get right into it. Um, let's stand and open in prayer. I'm going to ask my husband. I'm not sure if your mic's on, but here. <laughs> open in prayer, please. Father, we thank you for this night that you've let us come into your house, Father. Lord, you've given us our health. You've given us the ability, Father, to walk into this place tonight. Lord, to worship you, Father. Lord, to give ourselves to you tonight, God. I pray, Lord, that you would just come down yes. and among us this night, yes. God, and yes. just work, Lord, Father, through these vessels that are so weak, Father, and so needy. Lord, come down tonight and touch us, Lord. Yes. Refresh us, renew yes. us, rejuvenate us, Lord. Lord, break the chains, Lord, that keep us yes. bound and from the things that you would have us to yes. do, Father. I pray tonight you would be in the worship, Lord, that you would be in the word. Father, we thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Christ our Redeemer died on the cross, died for a sinner, paid all his due. Sprinkle your soul with the blood of the Lamb, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the 
the blood when I see the blood when I see the blood I will pass I will pass over you chiefest of sinners Jesus will save that he has promised that he will do oh wash in the fountain open for sin and i will pass will pass over you when i see the blood when i see the blood when i see the blood i will pass i will pass over you Judgment is coming, all will be there, each one receiving justly his due. Hide in the saving sin, cleansing blood, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, blood I will pass I will pass over you oh great compassion oh boundless love oh loving kindness faithful and true find peace and shelter under the blood and I will pass will pass over you oh when I When I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over I know it was the blood, I know it was the blood, I know it was the blood for me. One day when I was lost, Jesus died upon the cross. Oh, I know it was the blood for me. They nailed him to a tree, they nailed him to a tree, they nailed him to a tree for me. Oh, one day when I was lost, Jesus died upon the cross. Oh, I know it was the blood for me. The blood came streaming down. The blood came streaming down. The blood came streaming down for me. One day when I was lost, Jesus died upon the cross. Oh, I know it was the blood for me. They laid him in a tomb. They laid him in a tomb. Oh, they laid him in a tomb for me. One day when I was lost, Jesus died upon the cross. Oh, I know it was the blood for me. He rose up from the dead. He rose up from the dead. He rose up from the dead for me. Oh, one day when I was lost, Jesus died upon the cross. Oh, I know it was the blood for me. He's coming back again. He's coming back again. He's coming back again for me. One day when I was lost, Jesus died upon the cross. Oh, I know it was the blood for me. I've got the Holy Ghost down in my soul i've got the holy ghost down in my soul i've got the holy ghost down in my soul and i'm on fire fire for my lord no you don't know like i know what he's done for me you don't know like i know what he's done for me you don't know like i know what he's done for me and I'm on fire, fire for my Lord. 
Well, he saved my soul. That's what he's done for me. Well, he saved my soul. That's what he's done for me. Well, he saved my soul. That's what he's done for me. And I'm on fire, fire for my Lord. Oh, he healed my body. That's what he's done for me. Well, he healed my body. That's what he's done for me. Well, he healed my body. That's what he's done for me. And I'm on fire, fire for my Lord. I've got the Holy Ghost down in my soul. I've got the Holy Ghost down in my soul. I've got the Holy Ghost down in my soul and I'm on fire fire for my Lord no you don't know like I know what he's done for me you don't know like I know what he's done for me you don't know like I know what he's done for me and I'm on fire fire for my Lord well he saved my soul that's what he's done for me Yes, he saved my soul. That's what he's done for me. Yes, he saved my soul. That's what he's done for me. And I'm on fire, fire for my Lord. And he healed my body. That's what he's done for me. Yes, he healed my body. That's what he's done for me. Yes, he healed my body. That's what he's done for me. And I'm on fire fire for my Lord. And I've got the Holy Ghost down in my soul. I've got the Holy Ghost down in my soul. I've got the Holy Ghost down in my soul. And I'm on fire, fire for my Lord. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lamb of God. Oh, we've come to worship you, Jesus. Oh, we've come to magnify you, Lord. Blessed be your name, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, God. Praise you, Lamb of God. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here. You're moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You're working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. And you are here. Touching every heart, I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You are here. Healing every heart, I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You're mending. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, you're turning lives around, I worship you, I worship you, 
Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, you are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You're working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working, Lord. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. And you are here. You're touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. I worship you, you are here, you're mending every heart, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, you're turning lives around, I worship you, I worship you, oh, you're the way Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Oh, you're the way maker, Jesus. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 Way make miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Oh, and you never change, Lord. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, 
That is who you are. 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 Oh, praise you, Jesus. Oh, that's who you are, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We sing worthy. We sing worthy. We sing worthy to the Lord. We sing worthy. We sing worthy, we sing worthy to the Lord. Praise and glory, praise and glory, praise and glory to the Lord. Praise and glory, praise and glory. Praise and glory, praise and glory, praise and glory to the Lord. Praise and glory, praise and glory, praise and glory to the Lord. Hallelujah. We sing worthy 
to the Lord. We sing worthy. We sing worthy. We sing worthy to the Lord. Praise and glory. Praise and glory, praise and glory to the Lord. Praise and glory, praise and glory, praise and glory to the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lord. And we sing worthy. We sing worthy. We sing worthy to the Lord. Oh, we sing worthy, Lord. We sing worthy. We sing worthy. We sing worthy to the Lord. Praise and glory. Praise and glory. Praise and glory to the Lord. Praise and glory. Praise and glory. Praise and glory to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, you are worthy, Jesus. Oh, you are worthy. Lord, come on, church, say something out loud to the Lord tonight. Praise Him in the sanctuary. Praise Him. Hallelujah. He is worthy. Oh, hallelujah, Lamb of God. Hallelujah, Lamb of God. We praise You. We magnify You. We worship and adore You in this house, Jesus. Oh, we sing worthy, worthy to the Lamb who was slain. Worthy to You and You alone, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise you, Lamb of God. Oh, you inhabit the praise of your people, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 
Hallelujah, hallelujah to the Lord. Praise you, Lord God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Freedom reigns in this place. Showers of mercy and grace falling on every face. There is freedom. Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of and grace falling on every face there is freedom and Jesus reigns in this place with showers of mercy and grace tonight and when you're tired and you're thirsty there is freedom if you're tired and you're thirsty there is freedom oh if you're tired and you're thirsty 
If you're tired and you're thirsty, there is freedom. If you're tired and you're thirsty, there is freedom. And freedom reigns in this place. Showers of mercy and grace falling on every face. of mercy and grace falling on every faith there is freedom and freedom reigns in this place showers of mercy and grace Falling on every face, there is freedom. And freedom reigns in this place. Showers of mercy and grace. Falling on every face there is freedom oh hallelujah oh there's freedom tonight saints in Jesus oh there's freedom tonight at the cross of Calvary hallelujah oh hallelujah hallelujah the debt was paid hallelujah Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, God. Praise you, God. Thank you, Lord God. Jesus, Jesus. I'm telling you, you need to spend more time with me. The only way you're going to get through the trials and tribulations that are coming is to spend this time with me. You need to be strengthened for the battle that's ahead of you. Spend your time with me. You will gain your strength. You will have that peace that surpasses all understanding. You will march forward in the name of Jesus. Come to me. Stay with me. Abide in me. And I will abide in you. I will get you through it. <laughs> Father God. Father God, you always remind us of your presence. You always remind us of the need to stay in your presence, to seek your face always, and to be a people of prayer. We do those simple things. We stay in God's presence and we seek him. We run to him in our trials and tribulations. He's the only one that can bring us peace and wisdom. He's the only one that really has the answer. And he reminds us not to stress, not to strain, not to worry, but bring our requests to him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he is a prayer answering God. But if there's no prayers, there can't be any answers. <laughs> there's got to be prayers. So spend less time worrying, more time praying. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Give the, God, give the Lord a, 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 a clap offering tonight, a praise. Thank you, God. 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 Hallelujah. Oh, glory, 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 glory to his name. Glory to his name. What a beautiful time of worship. I love songs that talk about him being worthy because he so is. He's the true and living God. 
praise him, praise him, praise him. We're going to keep celebrating tonight with our tithes and our offerings and our gifts, and I think Alex and Sam have the bags. <laughs> Yay, come on down. Come on down. Tonight's offering will be going to our evangelists, so if you're going to write a check, write it to the church, and we'll make sure we, we bless them tonight. Father, we thank you for an opportunity, Lord, to bless this couple that have ministered here now for weeks, actually encouraging us, hearing from God and speaking to us the words of, of, of life and encouragement and some conviction, which is really good. So let us bless them back tonight in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Praise him, praise him, praise him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Father. Come and pray over our evangelist tonight, please. Father, I thank you for this man of God tonight. I thank you, Lord, that you've brought him into this place, Father. I thank you, Father, that you've given him a word for this church, Father. And I pray this night, God, that you would open our ears, that you would open our hearts. God, that you would reveal yourself to us tonight in the, a great way, Father. In such a way, Lord, that we wouldn't be able to deny it, Father. I pray this night, God, that you would move over this congregation. That you would meet every need that's represented in this house, God. Lord, every healing, Father. Every financial need, Father. Every need, Father, we pray this night, God, that you would meet it, Father, that you would meet us this night, Father, we pray. Lord, give my brother liberty this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening. Thank you, Jesus. Well, it's been a very enjoyable time being with you all. You can stay up there if you want. I don't care, but, you know. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, Father, we come before you now in the precious and wonderful name of Jesus, and we ask that you would anoint this message, uh, anoint the preacher, anoint everyone's ears that they can hear in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Well, what I want to do is I want to look at Jesus this evening, and we're going to look at him in a particular way. And um, I imagine that a little bit of what I'm going to say is going to uh, shatter a few ideas you have about Jesus. And uh, so I just want to be able to share this and help us understand uh, what the truth is in this matter. So we're going to look at, at uh, friend of sinners, and that's with a big question mark. Is Jesus a friend of sinners? Well, I guess the thing we have to really look at is who said that? Who said that Jesus was a friend of sinners? Well, you see, he was accused of being a friend of sinners by Pharisees. And it was not 
presented in the idea of something positive. It was an attack against him because he was being the greatest missionary this world has ever known. And he was going among those who lived all kinds of lives from, from the Pharisees that were uh, religious hypocrites to the prostitutes and tax collectors. And he went among them to win them. And because he was going among those who were the, the destitute and the debauched of society, he was labeled a friend of sinners. But it wasn't a, a positive thought that was given. Because is Jesus really a friend of sinners? Well... I don't believe he was. I believe he had another thing that he was doing. He had something else that he was about. You see, Jesus was the greatest missionary this world has ever known or ever will know. He was a missionary. And the only ones who were friends were those who entered into relationship with him. Whether in the Old Testament, such as people like Abraham, that was called the friend of God. Why? Because he walked in fellowship with God. Or those who were in the New Testament, he called them friends because they had become disciples. But he wasn't calling the prostitutes and the Pharisees and those, he wasn't calling them friends. And so it was the Pharisees that, called, that said Jesus was a friend of sinners. And it was one of the ways he was trying to do it to make him look bad. Look, he's just like all those other people out there and trying to, uh, to just cause him to be uh, rejected by the populace. But the people the common people, the people that were supposedly by their ideas sinners, those were the ones that were accepting him because he saw, they saw that Jesus was coming to them for them. He was coming to rescue them. He was coming to bring them the truth. And of course, the majority of the people didn't listen to him, but there were some that did. There were some that heard and entered into a place of relationship with him and became friends. Now, the Pharisees called Jesus a friend of sinners, like I said, in a derogatory manner. But we've got to understand who the Pharisees were. The Pharisees, that name Pharisee, means separated ones. And when the group of Pharisees happened, which was a couple hundred years prior to this, they were a group that were trying to live separate because there was so much compromise in the Jewish church. All right, so there was all this compromise, so they were trying to regain some purity of the Jewish faith and be separated from that which was common. But by the time it got to Jesus, it had morphed into something really ugly. I mean, they had these, these oral traditions that eventually got written down and became the Mishnah, and it was the, the oral traditions that they had that they had to memorize, that the Pharisees had to memorize and the teachers of the law, they had to memorize them to pass them on to the others, and it just, it just heaped one law upon another upon another that was not within the Mosaic law, but was of their own making. And so here are these people that had the idea that if you touch anything that is unclean, you are unclean then. So if you touch a person that is defiled because they are a sinner, you will be defiled. You'll be unclean. And so here's Jesus touching the sinners. And guess what? He's not getting unclean. He is touching sinners, making them clean. It was the total opposite. But they could not comprehend the reality of that because they had such a distorted, legalistic idea of religion. They didn't understand what it was to have fellowship with God. Their whole idea of, of, of religion was a list of do's and don'ts, and you had to keep to those very strictly. The problem is, is the law went and said, be perfect, and there wasn't one Pharisee that was perfect. So they were all sinners, just as bad as the worst prostitute or the worst drunkard or the, or, or the worst uh, murderer that was out there. They were just as bad. They just had different names of their sins is all. And so, are the lost friends of Jesus? No. But Jesus was friendly and compassionate towards sinners. But they weren't friends. And I'll really bring this out and present some of this thought when we get more towards the end of the message. But the thing that becomes so important here that we've got to see, and this is something that's, that, that I really am going to want us to understand, is how does a person become a friend of God? And your eternity depends upon that. If you don't become a friend of God, then you will be an enemy of God forever and ever and ever. And that's what is going to take place in the, in the depths of hell where people are separated from God, and they will be what they have been all their life here, rejecting God forever. 
But if we want to become friends of God, then there has to be something that happens. It's not just some sentimental notion. It's not just even going to church. You aren't a Christian because you go to church. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't go to church. You should, and you should go to a good church, a good Bible-believing church, and this is a good one. So it's a good one to come to. All right, but you have to come to the place of real relationship with Christ, that place where you come to understand who he is and what he came to do and why we sang about the blood in some of the songs because he was this lamb of God that died on the cross for us so that we could be forgiven. That blood was poured out as an offering to pay the penalty that we should be paying. So what I want to do is I want to take a little journey through a few chapters in the Gospel of Luke. And I want to look at this idea whether or not Jesus is a friend of sinners. Luke chapter 7. And I'm just going to kind of lay this story out so we understand this rather than reading the whole thing. So we'll just read a, a little portion of it in a couple of minutes. But this account begins in verse 36 where Jesus invited to eat at Pharisee's house. Now this happened many times actually. Jesus was asked to eat at many Pharisees' house. And every time he was asked, it was always... Uh, 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 an antagonistic invitation. They were not friends. The Pharisees were enemies. So when they asked Jesus to dinner, usually after a Sabbath, okay, so it would be the Sabbath meal, so they would ask him there to somehow try and entrap him so they could somehow accuse him and either silence him or have him executed. So they were all enemies. you got to understand, the Pharisees were enemies. There were a couple of Pharisees, that had become secret followers of Jesus, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. But the rest of them were, were just hostile. They hated Jesus. They hated who he was. They were jealous. We're told that one place in, the, in one of the Gospels that they were jealous of Jesus, and Pilate himself recognized that reality. And so what's going on is this Pharisee asked Jesus to come and eat. And what those usually were is they would be kind of like, especially in villages, they'd be kind of like a village, um, you know, people can come who wants to, you can come and watch us eat and, and, and listen to the conversation that goes on. So the invited guests would be gathered around a, a common table and then there'd, all be, then there'd be these cushions all around it and they would recline at the table as what they did in the, in the Greek-Roman style. So these were the wealthier people that were copying the Roman style of eating rather than the Jewish style that was on, a, on the floor or on little stools. And uh, so they were copying that, and they would all gather around. Then the people from the village, if they wanted to come, they could come and sit around the backside of it and uh, listen to what was going on, to, to hear the conversation that would be going on. Because usually in those events, somebody important was being invited so that somebody that was important would be speaking and somehow sharing with the people so they would come to hear him. So Jesus was invited, and people came. Now, one of the things that you have in that culture, and it was extremely important, is that the, the idea of hospitality. Now, our idea of hospitality is nothing like their idea of hospitality. Hospitality is extremely important, extremely important. So when somebody came under your roof, you became obligated to that person to protect them, such as in the story of Lot where the people tried to, to take the angels that, that had come into their home and uh, other situations that happened like that, it was really important that, that when a guest came in your home, they were protected, but they were also honored. And one of the things that you did, especially with an honored guest coming in, is you would wash their feet when they would come in. So it would be a, a servant that would come and wash the feet, but then you would give him a kiss on each cheek. And then you'd have some oil, scented oil, put upon his head. And I think maybe the reason for this is sheer speculation, so don't hold me as if I'm, I'm an authority on it, but I think the reason for it was is because they didn't take showers and baths like we do. So they were a little bit of a smelly lot, and you put kind of this, this, this oil, this ointment, and it would just be this beautiful aroma that kind of make it that everybody else didn't smell as bad. <laughs> That's just a guess there, okay? I'm just guessing. I think it's a pretty good idea, though. Might keep some oil around your house if you get some smelly guests coming over. <laughs> but when Jesus came into that house, the Pharisee didn't do any of that. You understand? He didn't wash Jesus' feet. He didn't give him a kiss. He didn't anoint him with oil. 
And he did that on purpose so that everybody there could see his disdain of Jesus. I mean, this was obvious. This was something, invite Jesus, but I'm going to treat him like trash. I'm going to make sure he knows I'm treating him like trash because I don't like what he's doing and I think he's wrong and I'm trying to find something wrong that he's doing so I can get him in trouble. Hostile. The man was absolutely hostile. And I would almost guarantee you that there are other Pharisees, maybe experts in the, in the law. They were also called at that time lawyers. And they were probably there. And, and so he had these group of antagonists. And Jesus went right into the midst of them knowing what they were. He knew what they were. He knew what they were about. He wasn't stupid. He understood what was going on. But you see, he was a missionary. The absolute best missionary there's ever been. And he went fishing. And who was he fishing for? Somebody you wouldn't think he'd go fishing for, at least from a natural standpoint. Certainly not from a pharisaical standpoint. And so I imagine how it happened. So all these things aren't always put in there, so we've got to try and, and try and think how it could happen. But I would imagine from all the guests that were gathered around, there was this woman that was in there. She was in their midst, and that's how she got in. That's how she could get in without being stopped. And she was a prostitute, a sinner woman, which was a nice way of the Scriptures referring to her occupation. We don't know how she came across Jesus originally, but I believe from her response, I believe that she had to hear him preach out there, see the miracles that he did. And she fell under tremendous conviction of sin for the life that she had lived. And she understood something that the Pharisees didn't understand. She understood that she was a sinner. She understood that she was at odds with Almighty God. And so she came in there, and she came behind Jesus, and the scripture says that, that she began to weep at his feet, it would be behind, his feet would be back because he'd be reclining on pillows, and she began to weep, and those were tears of repentance, and as she weeped, she let her hair down and wiped his feet with her hair, kissed his feet, and anointed her feet. You see, this sinner woman did what the Pharisee did not do. He honored her, he, he, she honored him. And she went and gave him that kiss and the ointment and the, and the tears to wash the feet, showing the reality that she was seeing him like the Pharisees did not. She was seeing him as one that could rescue her from her own horrible life. Now what happened in it is this woman is weeping at his feet and he's receiving that. You understand, he's, he's letting her do that. This is homage being given to him, which was rightly due him. He knew what was going on in the, in the Pharisee's heart. And so he confronts him. And he confronts him in a way that you and I don't really comprehend because we're Americans of the 21st century. If you were of, of Jewish culture 2,000 years ago, you would understand. But what happened is Jesus went and looked at this woman and we got to understand, it wasn't just a woman, she was a sinner woman. She was a woman that had, had lived a terrible life. He looks at the woman and speaks to Simon, the, the, the Pharisee, and he begins to rebuke him while he's looking at this woman. And that would be a tremendous insult to that man. And he ends up bringing a, a, a parable. I'm not going to go through it all. But then he said in verse 47, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much, but he who has been forgiven little loves little. And so he looked at this woman and says, she has sinned much, but she is loving like the Pharisees can't love, don't know how to love. And as a result of her willing to weep at my feet and willing to show me such, such simple expression of devotion, her sins are forgiven. But you Pharisees that you think you're so good and you wear all your religious clothes and you do all these religious things, you don't understand how, ter how tremendous are your sins and so your sins remain while hers is forgiven. If you've ever seen the movie Jesus of Nazareth, uh, not bad, it's okay, a lot of Hollywood in it and I think a stoic Jesus, which I'm not really too crazy over. I mean, he does good acting in that, but this one scene with the sinner woman is just, I just love it. Because what does he do? He reaches down, he grabs this woman's face, looks in those eyes, and makes a, that phenomenal statement, your sins are forgiven. You know what happened? She became a friend. That's how people become a friend of Jesus. The others were, were enemies. 
You understand? They were enemies. Jesus went into that house for that one woman. That's what kind of missionary he is. I mean, he'll go right into the midst of a, of a den of lions to get this one lamb that's being destroyed, rescue that one lamb so that lamb can now know what it is to love God and be loved by God. Well, the story goes on a little bit more, and now Jesus ends up around Capernaum. And Capernaum became kind of his home base. So you could think of Capernaum as a lot of miracles. When you start really studying it out, you'll see a lot of miracles happen in Capernaum. And Capernaum was a good-sized city, so it wasn't as big as Jerusalem, but it was a good-sized city. And it had a uh, Roman contingent of soldiers that was there. And uh, so Jesus was ministering to a large crowd. And uh, in the midst of that, what does he do? He gets up and leaves. So one day, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they got in a boat and they set out. So here is Jesus in the boat. And uh, he falls asleep in the boat. Now, why did he fall asleep? Because God incarnate had a real human body that got tired and hungry, right? So he had to eat and he had to sleep. And I don't doubt from the schedule that he was doing, he was exhausted. And so here he is falling asleep in the boat. But there's something about Jesus we've got to understand. He had no worry. He didn't worry. He wasn't concerned about getting where he needed to go. He knew his father. He knew the mission he was on. He knew that everything would work out exactly the way it was. And this was actually, I believe, a divine plan that was going to be, be done for the sake of his disciples and also for the mission work he was about to do. So what happens? He falls asleep and a storm comes up. All right, this storm, and, and you had, some of those disciples were fishermen, so those fishermen, they knew what storms were. They knew when something was bad and when something wasn't that big a deal. You know, they'd been in enough storms, they understood it, and they got afraid. So because they got afraid, we got to understand that this was a serious storm, and Jesus was still sleeping. In one of the other accounts, it brings out the aspect, says, don't you care that we're going to die? They go in and shake him and try to wake him up. Don't you care we're going to die? You know, he's like, we're not going to die. Don't worry about it. You know, I mean, it's like he could have said that, but he understood these were just silly little sheep, okay? And they didn't understand very well. But, you know, I mean, the patience of Christ is just astounding. It is astounding. You know, and if you ever feel that you're kind of like kind of ridiculous sometimes, just uh, read the Gospels and look at the apostles and disciples and you'll say, okay, I fit right in. And so what does Jesus do? He gets up, he rebukes the sea, and it becomes absolutely calm. Now, I don't know what they were expecting. They woke him up, and he says, don't you care that we're going to die? What did he want? Did they want Jesus to wake up so he could die wide awake with them? Or, I mean, what was it? I really don't know. Because they were so astounded when the sea was instantly calmed. The wind died down. They were astounded at him. And... They ended up saying in fear and amazement, they asked one another, who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. I like one translation that, that's translated, says, what kind of man is this? I mean, that was a good question. They didn't know what kind of man it was, but that's not something people do. To speak to the ocean, it's calm. The winds die down. And so... They continued then on their journey because Jesus was going someplace. You understand, he just didn't go out to have a little bit of time out on the sea and that there, he was going somewhere. And so what happened is he was going in the region of the Gerasenes, which was across the lake in Galilee. It tells us in chapter 8, verse 27, when Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had, worn, had not worn clothes or lived in a house. He had lived in the tombs. And some of the other gospel accounts of that, you know, share a little bit more about him and what he was like. But he was this demon-possessed man that uh, lived a horrendous, miserable life, being tormented constantly from his demon possession. One of the accounts says that when Jesus stepped ashore, he was, he was at a distance and he began running. So... Jesus left a multitude to go out in a boat in the middle 
of, an, of, of a storm, to calm the storm, so that he could be just at the perfect time at the shore when that demoniac that normally is in all the tombs is out there and begins coming his way. Was that demon-possessed man a friend of Jesus? I don't think so. Can you get an enemy more than a demon-possessed individual? I mean, possessed by demons, and, and the name of the man, the name of the demon was Legion, which would be, you know, a legion is a couple thousand soldiers. So I don't know how many that man really had, but he was full of, full of the devil. He wasn't a friend of Jesus, but Jesus was a missionary. He was going after that man. He wanted that demon-possessed man. To me, that's astounding. He wanted that, that, that prostitute to come out of her prostitution. He was now going to set a demon-possessed man free. So what did he do? I mean, most of you know the story, but if you don't, what happened is uh, Jesus cast the devils out and sent them into a herd of swine. Now, the herd of swine was there because where this was taking place was in Gerasenes, which, is, which was one of the, the cities of the Decapolis, and the Decapolis means ten, so it was kind of a grouping of ten cities. And so this was kind of the outskirts of it, and it was a predominantly Gentile uh, city. And so the Jews are forbidden to eat, eat uh, pork. And uh, so having all those pigs there would have been Gentiles. They would have been owned by Gentiles. And whoever was herding them, we don't know who the swine herd men were. But uh, can you just imagine when you cast the devil out of, out, of, out of the man, they go into the swine and it says that they went crazy and they ran over a cliff to their death. The pigs went mad. You wonder why that man was mad? I mean, he had a lot of devils in him. And so they all went over, they all died, and what would you do if you were the swine herdsmen? Because all of a sudden, those men, however many they were, they all became legally liable for the debt of those animals. They were the ones to watch. Now they're gone. And I guarantee you, they were freaking right out. And they just didn't know what to do. And so they went into town, and they understood what they needed to do then. They needed to do some blame shifting. Take the blame off of us. We didn't do anything wrong. Put it on Jesus, the one who cast the devils out. And that's what they did. So the people of the town came out, and they looked over where the pigs had gone over the, 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 the uh, cliff and to their death at the edge of the sea there. And uh, I don't think they were happy. <laughs> you know, I don't think they were happy at all. In chapter 8, verse 35, it says, The people went to see what had happened, when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed in his right mind. And they were afraid. I mean, I have to imagine that they probably tried to do something sometime for that man, tried to cast out devils through whatever gods they happened to serve or whatever it was that they were doing and, and that there. They probably tried to do all that to no avail. The man only got worse and worse and more and more filled with devils and more and more of a, a terror because people were afraid of the man. And so now they see one greater, stronger than the demons that was in that man. And they're now afraid of Jesus. They're afraid of Jesus, but instead of understanding that he came to be a redeemer to them, they were afraid and they did the most foolish thing they could do. They drove him away. They told Jesus, leave us. Now, isn't that strange? Leave us. Leave us alone. We don't want that power that you have over devils working in our lives. We don't want you to change us. We don't want you to do anything again that's going to cause us this kind of financial, financial loss. And they drove Jesus away. But you know what happened? They found that man in his right mind. Now, I'm going to say something here. I think you really need to understand the only way that we can really come to our right mind is when we enter into true salvation. Because he begins to straighten out all the crooked mess of the way that we think, all the worldly ways, all the baggage that we have from all the sin and all the pain and all the hurts in our life and all that that goes on. And it's only when Jesus breaks into our life, when we welcome him and allow him, that he starts bringing some sanity to us. See, they understood something in one sense. That if there's a man that can cast devils out, set that man free, that he's in his right mind, that's one scary man. 
And if I'm his enemy, I'm in trouble. Get him out of here. But if I'm his friend, I have no greater ally. You know what happened? That man became a friend. The demoniac became a friend. And he even says that he wanted to go with Jesus, but Jesus told him, says, no, I have a job for you to do. I want you to go back and tell everybody what happened. See what he did? He went back into the Decapolis, okay, those 10 cities. You know what happened later? Jesus comes to the Decapolis, and because of all the work that former demoniac did in testifying to the wonder of being set free, and, and people knew the man. He probably had on his arms and body and everything all the marks, because it used to say that he, that he cut himself with stones, and so all the evidence of who he really was, testifying what Jesus did when Jesus came there, revival broke out. So he went for one man. Now do you know what Jesus did? He was driven away by the people. Leave here. We don't want you on our land. Okay. <laughs> I'll go back where I came from. That's what he did. He goes back right where he left. Guess who's waiting there for him? A crowd of people. The crowd he had left. He left them all to go after that one demoniac. He is the most astounding missionary there has ever been or ever could be. Now he's in Capernaum. All right, and where does, what does he do then? You know, he, he comes along, and this account is, is in uh, Luke, but I'm going to share it from Matthew. But uh, he comes across this tax collector. And tax collectors were, were wealthy individuals, especially if you became a chief tax collector, which meant that you were a tax collector over tax collectors. And so you have a tax collector, and what it was is Rome went and says, we want this much money in taxes. And the taxes were not as what we have here. The taxes was predominantly upon the merchants. So goods coming into the country, going out of the country, so they were basically tariffs. And so here was, here was Matthew, Levi, at his tax booth, probably becoming a very, very wealthy man as a result, because Rome says charge this much, you can add to it whatever you want. So what did they do? They added to whatever amount it was enough so they started making a really serious income. That's why they were so hated. Because it wasn't just that they collect taxes, but they added a bunch to it so that they could become rich. And so here's this man that is hated by people, and I guess tax collectors in every nation and culture and time have been hated, okay? I mean, I don't care what, what government they're under. They're just not popular people. And uh, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, Jesus saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. He left everything. He left it all. That was the end of his income from that. How much he understood of that, I don't know. But I'll tell you what he did understand. He was once an enemy. Now he became a friend. And he understood how great was that friendship, that he would be willing to leave everything to have that friendship and to keep that friendship. So what happens now is Matthew puts on a banquet. And who does he invite to his banquet? All of these tax collectors and sinners of all kinds of sorts. So you have this house of Matthew, a rich, a rich man, that is filled with all these people that have lived debauched lives, and Jesus is the guest of honor. All right, you understand why the Pharisees accused him a friend of sinners. He wasn't being their friend, he was being a missionary. He was coming to them to rescue their lives. And so we're not told what goes on in there. We know that outside is the multitude at least a portion of it, that was waiting for him on the seashore. They followed him to Matthew's house, and now Matthew is there, and all these, these people that are, are just living horrendous lives, and they're all there, and the Pharisees are outside, and they're, uh, they're accusing Jesus and the disciples, attacking them from outside the door. Why was it outside the door? They would not come into the place and become unclean, right? They were separatists in the extreme concept of it. And so they wouldn't come in. And, and sadly to say, even some of John the Baptist's disciples were outside that door harassing the disciples of Jesus because they couldn't understand what Jesus was doing. John the Baptist preached in the open and people came to him. Jesus is going into people's homes. He's getting right down in the nitty-gritty of the, of the life and the misery and the pain and the sorrow. So 
It says, when the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? I don't know if they could even give that answer. <laughs> but now something happens. Something happens. You see, think of this. You have all the Pharisees, all these Pharisees outside the door of Matthew's house. They're all gathered there. Then you have all these other people that are out there. And there's this synagogue ruler. Now, what is a synagogue ruler? A synagogue ruler would be a pastor, in essence, of a synagogue, of a local synagogue. And in that culture, especially, it was a very prestigious position. So in Capernaum, there would have been many different synagogues. We don't know which one he had. Some have tried to go back in, in history and archaeology and try and say that it was the prominent, the big one in, in uh, Capernaum, but we don't know for sure. But one way or the other, he was a synagogue ruler. And the Pharisees were deeply tied into the synagogues. So that meant the Pharisees went to synagogue every Sabbath, and they had strong influence in the synagogues. Now, this would more than likely mean that this man, the synagogue ruler's name is Jairus, and uh, that Jairus was hostile to Jesus like the Pharisees were. But something had changed in his life. His daughter was dying. His 12-year-old daughter was dying. Nothing he could do to solve it. He probably called the best of the best doctors to come in, and they couldn't do nothing for this little girl. So in desperation... He says, there's only one hope. There's only one thing. I've heard of Jesus. I believe that Jesus probably even spoke in a synagogue. And so he comes to Matthew's house. He hears where Jesus is. He comes to Matthew's house. And to get into Matthew's house, he has to go through a crowd of Pharisees. These are all people he knew. These were all religious friends. And he is not concerned about one of them. He's just pushing them aside, and I can just imagine, says, where are you going, Jairus? Where are you going? What are you doing? You can't go in that house. I mean, you understand? Try and get the picture of what's going on here. He doesn't care. He goes through them all, and then what does he do? He just doesn't stand before Jesus, says, Jesus, will you do me a favor? He goes and he falls at Jesus' feet and begs Jesus to come heal his daughter. So Jesus came for those sinners. But he knew another sinner was going to come, too. <laughs> a religious sinner, right? So what does Jesus do? He stops the meal right there. I imagine that he had already done a lot of teaching to them. Matthew had already went and, 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 and become a follower and whatever else went in there. I would guarantee you some of those other people had been tr become true followers of Jesus. But when Jesus went to leave with Jairus, I imagine that all those people that were there, we know the disciples went with him, so disciples were there with him as he's traveling along, and probably the people that were in the banquet are following along. Then the Pharisees begin to follow along, and all these other people follow along, and soon you've got this massive crowd trying to move through the streets, and they can hardly make any headway. I mean, they're pressing upon Jesus. And can you just imagine the synagogue ruler? He is like going, get out of my way. i got to get Jesus to my daughter. She's dying. I mean, he's in a panic. Jesus isn't, of course. But the synagogue ruler is. But you know, there was another encounter he was going to have here in a different way. There's a woman for 12 years that she'd had this issue of blood, this bleeding, and she had spent all of her money on doctors to try and get better, but it tells us that it only grew worse. You know what that woman had come to? A place of hopelessness. Now, in the count, we're not told of a husband or children. doesn't mean they weren't there. My guess is that this probably began at a young enough age that she could never get married. Nobody would marry her because she had this, this disease that she could not have any cure for. So she was in this place of having to spend everything she had, however she made that money, that she, she spent everything she had for doctors, couldn't get any better. And so it wasn't just that she was, she was in a hopeless condition with her illness, but she was probably in a hopeless condition in her life. The loneliness, can you understand the loneliness that had to be there? The hurts in her life, the feeling of that hopelessness is just, it's miserable. And so she heard about Jesus. Maybe she heard him preach. Maybe she was one of the ones out there in the multitude sometime. 
And it just came into her mind, says, if I could only but touch the hem of his garment, if I could only touch his hem. Now, I do not doubt in the least that this disease that she had made her very tired. And so she had this terrible job of trying to push her way through all the men and all the people that were gathering around Jesus, all the disciples that were trying to be his protection, which he didn't need, but they were still trying to do it. And so she's having to push through them all. And I can just imagine every bit of strength that she has, she is wearing herself out just with this one thing of faith in her. If I can but touch the hem of his garment, and finally she breaks through, and she just barely touches it, and Jesus feels the power flow out of him to this woman. He knew it, and he stopped right there, and he said, who touched me? Who touched me? And it was kind of sad because the disciples go and say, what do you mean, who touched you? All these people are pressing on you. All these people are touching you. Ah, uh, but he knew something different. This was a touch of faith. This was faith reaching out. This was faith just saying, there is no other hope for me. There's no other remedy. And so she's reaching out. And when she touches it, she is healed. And Jesus begins to look in the crowd. And he could have picked her out. But before he could pick her out, the woman trembling, it says, came to him. And why would she come trembling? Because she just didn't know what kind of reception she would have. Were they like the Pharisees? Were they like the synagogue rulers that looked down upon us? What's she, how's he going to treat me? And so what did Jesus do? He dealt with her tenderly. Go your way. Go your way. You've been healed. You know what happened? She left as a friend. She left as a friend. Guarantee you that woman was never, ever, ever the same. Never the same. Well, the story is continuing. Jesus is still on the way to Jairus' house. In chapter 8, verse 49, says, While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Now, I think that's kind of ironic. You know, well, you can do something when they're alive, but when they're dead, you can't. You know what that basic idea was? There's this place, there's this line that is crossed that it's absolutely, completely impossible to do anything. So they thought as long as there was breath in that child, Jesus could do something. But now that she's dead, don't bother him, let him go off. He delayed too long. And I would probably think that in that man's mind, he was probably blaming Jesus because he didn't get there quick enough. So what happens? He finally gets to the home of the synagogue ruler, and it's filled with mourners. So it had taken enough time that all the mourners were there. Probably people were, were waiting around, knowing she was going to die. And so when she died, all the mourning went on. Now, it's not just that. is they had professional mourners. I can't say that they were or weren't, but in that culture, they had professional mourners, just like they had in, in Europe and in England. They used to have profe professional mourners. You could hire them, and they would show great tears and sorrow and everything else to make it look like you really cared when you probably didn't. But uh, in this case, the people did care. You know, mom and dad were, tr were truly heartbroken over the death of their daughter. And so he enters in, and uh, Jesus said to Jairus, don't, don't be afraid. Just believe, and she will be healed. And when Jesus gets to the house, the people laugh at him because he says, she's not dead. Laughed at him. They were mockers. They were enemies. And what did Jesus have to do? He had to drive them all out of the house. Not because their unbelief affected him, but because their unbelief affected Jairus and his wife. He was going to heal that daughter, but they had to have some part of it. They had to have some aspect of faith, how little it might be that Jesus drove them all out. And can you imagine, as Jesus driving them out of the house, how angry they are with him? Can you imagine how, how infuriated they were when they thought they should be there at the morning of the death of this child? All the ways that they were justified and how they, were, how they should be there and the anger lashing out at Jesus and he just, get out here, go get, get. Of course, he did it the nicest way possible, but uh, <laughs> I think it was hard to resist him. with mother and father and a couple of disciples, he goes in, goes up to the child, 
took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. And she rose. It was not hard. You understand, this was no harder to raise a dead child than what it was to heal the woman with the issue of blood or to forgive the sinner woman or to cast the devils out of a demoniac. It was no harder. Now, just imagine if you were mom and dad and that happened to you. I think you would be hysterical, right? I really think that's what went on. They were hysterical. I mean, they're just fawning over the girl, weeping, and, and so Jesus, trying to bring some sanity to it, says, give her something to eat. Okay, to, try to bring some purpose. Get your mind back together. Give her something to eat. It's been a long time since she's ate because she's been so sick. Give her something to eat. Everything's okay. She'll be all right now. You know what happened? That synagogue ruler became a friend of Jesus. You see, his whole agenda, constantly to bring people to the place that are enemies, to the place to become friends. Because that's what we are. Left to ourselves, we are enemies. If you're not right with Jesus, you are not a friend of his. You have lived a life that is hostile to him. Your life has been contrary. Your life has been saying, I don't want you in my life. I want to live my life my way. I don't want you to upset it or disturb it or define it or anything else. I'm going to do things the way I want to. You have willfully been an enemy. But the good news is that there's a God that's calling you to become a friend. He's giving you the invitation to become a friend. Now, you can either reject that invitation or accept it. That's up to you. He'll not make you be a friend or make you be an enemy. But if you're not his friend, then you are his enemy because you've made the choice that I will not follow you. I will not follow you. I live my life my way according to my agenda and not according to yours. So here's our condition. We are naturally enemies of Jesus. Sin is hostility to him. It is not just a little mistake. You understand, sin is not mistakes. Sin is willful. It's what we do. It's the choices we make that we know are wrong, where we violate our own conscience, and it's conscience that the Holy Spirit speaks to to help us know right from wrong on a basic note. But then when the ability for us to know who Jesus is, is there, then the sin can be greater because we say, I don't want to know who he is. So ignorance about God, especially in nations like America, is humongous because people have the ability to get a Bible all over the place to seek out who this God is, to know who he is. So their rejection of him saying, I don't even want to know about you is greater sin than people understand because they are willfully saying, you will have no part of my life and I don't even want to know what you have to tell me. But yet Jesus is still a good missionary. And he's still going after those who spew hatred at him, who reject him, who want nothing to do with him because he is out to make friends of any that will open their heart to him. Romans chapter 2, verse 6, says God will give to each person according to what he has done. What's going on in the brilliant work of the book of Romans is chapter 1, Paul is showing that all Gentiles or non-Jews are sinners. In chapter 2, he's showing that all Jews are sinners. And in chapter 3, he says everybody's a sinner. And the reason why he is so aggressive in laying this out because how can we go one step further? How can we come to the place of salvation that our life has been hostile to God? We will not come to him and cry out for forgiveness. So it had to be dealt with and dealt with very strongly before Paul could get into the reality that salvation comes by faith through grace. So this was all laid out. You are hopeless in yourself. You have no way of making heaven your home. You're not a good person. You've never been a good person. You'll never be a good person by yourself. Your only hope is coming to a Savior that will take enemies and make them friends. It's your only hope. There is no other hope, no other place. You cannot make heaven your home through any of your own moral goodness because your moral goodness is not very good. Then Romans chapter 2, verse 7 says, Those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. This is the blessing that God gives his friends. This is what he says I'll do. So because you have become my friend, because you have come and bowed your knee to me and you've owned me as Savior and Lord, because of that, I will give you 
immortality. I will give you life. I will give you my life. You will have blessings in my presence beyond anything you can imagine. But then in verse 8, he says, but for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. So wrath upon his enemies and blessings upon those who are his friends. Now, we have to understand that it's not God's will that anybody perish. God does not want to send anybody to hell. That's not his plan. That's not why he created mankind. You see, hell was made for the devil and his angels. And even then, God didn't want to damn angels to hell, but they rebelled against him. Why did all this have to go on trying to, trying to say in just a sentence or two the reality of why evil is in this world is God had to give mankind a free will. Otherwise, there could be no such thing as love. With a free will, there must be the real ability to choose. And in that garden, because I believe in a real Adam and a real Eve, I believe there was a real place and time where they weren't in sin and a time then where they chose to sin. Otherwise, we have no ability to explain why evil is in the world. And so here you have the fact that we are willful sinners, but God does not want to damn any of us to hell. He has made a way of escape through himself. And so in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit, the poison of vipers is on their lips, their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness, their feet are swift to shed blood, ruin and misery marks their way, the way of peace they do not know, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Why did I read that? So we understand a little bit more why enemies are enemies of God, because of their willful practice of sin. And if we can understand that, then we can begin to understand the wonder of God's love that he would break into our world to bring to us the reality of salvation that we might know him and know his love and become his friend. And so in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemies, Christ died for us. When we wanted nothing to do with him, Christ died for us. So he was the one seeking after us when we didn't even want to know who he was. He sought after us when we were rebels against him and maybe, even, maybe we knew of his existence or was raised in some kind of religious kind of home that didn't have real biblical Christianity and we were raised in that. We had some kind of knowledge that there was a God, but we rejected everything we had. Even the slight little nod we had because we said, I don't want anything to do with this God. Although the, the ideas and everything else would have been so distorted, I was raised in, in, in Catholicism, and I didn't know anything about being born again. I didn't know anything about a real relationship with God. And as a young man, I wanted nothing to do with it. I hated everything I was, I was forced to, to, to look at and follow because it was repulsive, because there wasn't anything of life. But yet he was seeking after me. And as a drug addict, that's where he found me. He came after a rebel. He came after an enemy. He came after a man who lived hostile to everything that Jesus stands for. But he sought me out because he wanted me. Do you realize that? There's not one person here that you're here by time and chance. There's a God that wants you. There's a God that's seeking after you. And those of you that are believers, he's still seeking after you to bring you nearer and nearer to him, that you might know more and more the joy of what is to belong to him, to be his friend, to know him as God and Savior and the depths and the wonder of what that is, to know his love that surpasses human understanding. He is still wanting us to understand that because we haven't come to an end. We have barely begun to know who this God is. And so then Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command. That sums it all up right there. You see, the only ones that are friends of Jesus are the ones that begin to learn how to obey him. And you know, just like, a, 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 just like we are normally, learning obedience is a hard process for us rebels. 
But when we start it, when we become friends, we start learning how to obey. We start learning how to turn from the rebellion. We start loving what is true and good and right and holy and pure. And we begin to reject what is all contrary to God and everything of his kingdom. And we begin to see how ugly that really is. And we want that which is truly beautiful as defined by God. We begin to love what he has to offer us. We begin to love his salvation and his life. And it becomes a joy to follow him and a joy to serve him. Not this heavy thing, but this beautiful, wonderful relationship of a God that makes himself known to his people. I have faith in God. But through faith in God, I have experienced God. I have known his love and tenderness. It is a real relationship, not a make-believe thing, not a figment of the imagination, but the reality of a God that will make himself known to those who are willing to turn from their rebellion and to become friends. And so all those that are friends need to cultivate Jesus' same heart. I just want to say this for a moment. We need to look at Jesus and how he did evangelism. I mean, there could be other ways that we can do it, okay? Cultures change, and so we have to say, how do we get into a culture? How do we reach people? And so every culture all over the world has its different dynamics and challenges and so on. But Jesus sought after sinners. He sought after them. But he never made them friends. They were always mission. It was always mission to them. And you see what happens with Christians when we cross the line and we start making non-Christians are best friends. We start forsaking the truth of God. We start compromising, and we move farther and farther away from him. When mission is always there, there is love and compassion there for a different reason. We care for their souls. We truly begin to care about them, and we want to win them to Jesus because we care about what they're going to be a million years from now. You understand, it's not just whether I know them and have a happy time with them now. It's whether you know, they're going to be with me a million years from now. I want them home with me. I want them with Jesus a million years from now. You understand, everything changes when it becomes mission because we should be people filled with compassion. We should be people that truly care about those who are rushing to hell. Our lives should be defined by that. Jesus came to seek and to save what was lost. And what should the mission of every Christian be? To seek and to save what is lost. It should be the same identical thing. And when we don't have that heart of compassion for the lost, then you know what we need to do? We need to honestly get on our knees and say, God, forgive me. I don't know how to have compassion by myself. Left to ourselves, we don't love like that. That is something that God will begin to infuse in the heart of those who begin to seek after him and say, God, help me to love better. Help me to love others better. Help me to be compassionate to the worst of the worst out there. So that we could be like Jesus to the prostitutes and the drug addicts. Yes, and even to the politicians and religious people. <laughs> okay, that's not far-fetched. No, I'm just kidding. It's not. <laughs> oh. If you don't know Jesus, he's seeking after you right now. He's wanting you right now. What are you going to do with him? What are you really going to do with Jesus? Because if you don't come to the place to own him as Savior and Lord, what are you going to say to him when you stand before him? There's one thing even more sure than taxes, and that's death. You will die. You will die. And I guarantee you, you are not a mere dog, a mere, a mere animal, and you're going to go back to the dust, and that's the end of you. You are created with purpose. You are created with divine purpose. God has something for your life, and it's not to be wasted, and he's calling you to the place to know him. And you know, I think it's so strange that we fight so hard, so hard against him. When he's calling and only wanting to do good to us, why do we resist? Why do we fight? When the Savior's pleading with us, why do we resist it? In just a moment, I'm going to open this altar up for anybody that's not a Christian or a backslider and you want to come home. But you know what this is going to take? It's going to take you humbling yourself. 
laying aside your fear of people. And not just your fear of people now, but tomorrow when you wake up, are you really going to begin to follow Jesus? Because that's what it does. When, if you come to an altar, you are saying, God, I'm changing sides. I'm no longer on an enemy. I want to be a friend of God. I want to walk as a friend. I want to know your friendly face. I want to know your friendly heart. I want to know your love towards me. And that means it begins to change everything in your life. Father, we come before you now in the precious and wonderful name of Jesus. And Lord, you know everyone here. You know our lives, God. You know those who are true Christians, those who are not. You know those who are backslidden, who at one time knew you but have forsaken you to go back to the world. God, you know us. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you would search hearts and you'd help people to understand their true spiritual condition. Lord, people are forced to make a decision tonight. Those who are not Christians will make a decision to either follow you or not to follow you. There is no way that we can be neutral in a message like this. There's no way we can be neutral. A choice will be made. And Lord, it's true for Christians as well. A choice will be made. Will I grow deeper in my fellowship with him? to get more and more the heart of God, that I might be, a, be a, a person that is reaching out with the compassion of God to hurting, dying people? We have that, that same decision in our own way that we have to make, and we are brought to the point, what are we going to do? Are we going to go deeper in our faith with Christ? Are we going to continue just to be shallow and, and absorbed with ourselves? Are we going to really begin to seek after him? And so, Lord, I'm asking that you would stir our hearts and every single heart here because you know where we are at. But Lord, I am pleading with you for any that do not know you as Lord and Savior. Lord, when I was in that park so long ago, just a dumb hippie strung out on drugs, I had no idea what was going on that moment when I surrendered to you. But Lord, I would never, ever, ever go back because what you have given me has been so beautiful and so wonderful. And the life and the love that you have showed me is so precious. God, I plead with you for those who don't know you that they would long to know your love that surpasses human understanding, oh God. Sweet Jesus, in your precious name we ask. In just a moment, I'm going to ask anybody here that's not a believer to come to this altar, to walk up to me. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to say anything. I just want somebody to pray with you. That's all. But like I said, you've got to lay aside pride. What, what is the value of pride if it keeps us from the kingdom of God? What value is it? Would everybody please stand? If you are not right with Jesus and you want to come home. You want to go from the side of being an enemy to that of being a friend. I want you to just walk forward. Walk up to me right now. Come forward right now. Pastor Sherman. Is there anybody else? Is there anybody else? What do you have to hold on to? What is going to keep you from an altar of repentance of saying, Jesus, I'm coming home? What is worth keeping you from it? Is there anything? Pride certainly isn't worth it. Because whatever will keep you from this altar is the God you truly serve. That is more important than you than anything else or anyone else. That's what defines your life. And in the end, is that God able to save you? But I guarantee you there's a Savior that can. Is there anybody here that you're not right with Jesus and you want to come home? I want you to come forward right now. Please, it's time to come.
Now, church, what I'm going to do for you is about mission. And if God has spoke to your heart that something needs to change and, and how you begin to look at, a, at those who don't know Jesus and he wants you to be filled with love and compassion for him and you need that in your life and you know you're lacking it, then I want you to come to an altar and just begin to cry out to God very simply, God, help me to love those who don't know you. Teach me how to reach them. God, help me to be a missionary like you were to a perishing world. And so, church, if you want to be up here and deal with this, I want you to find a place up here right now.
Oh, hallelujah. We thank you, God, for this time. We thank you for backsliders coming home in new salvations. We thank you for fresh fillings and answered prayer. We thank you for transformed hearts and minds, oh God. We thank you for this precious word. Let us take it home. Let us walk it, talk it, live it, breathe it, Lord, and not waste a, a word of it, God. I thank you for my brother for his, his gifting and his speaking words of truth to us tonight, God. And so bless my brothers and sisters now as we go our separate ways and bring us back Sunday in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen and amen and amen. Praise God. Thank you. Linger as long as you want. <laughs>